each one of us play our part in supporting the healing and the wholeness of our survivors right, of sexual harassment. So could, could you walk us through your own take? If I am working in HR or I'm a leader in an organisation, what are some things that I do that could encourage people to report sexual harassment and what things do I do that might actually severely discourage people from opening up about it? Well, I think maybe just in my experience, um, HR can have such a pivotal role when I was experiencing harassment to the point that I felt that I needed intervention from somebody. I tried. Um, the company that I was working at had a very strong anti harassment policy. Yeah. I used that policy. I took it to HR. I took it to every single level that I was supposed to. I followed every single procedure. Yeah. HR did nothing. And in fact, the entire HR department resigned because they were unable to do anything as a direct result of wow. them, of me trying to do something. And I think that it's such a, a perfect example really of HR is yes, an absolutely pivotal role here, but it also has to come from the top. Yeah, It has to come from the company in and of itself. And this is so much more than HR because HR need to have that training of how to be a first responder and how to help. But any kind of HR system needs to have teeth. They yeah. need to be able to do something. Yeah. They need to be able to do something to support people who are giving those reports to them. It's sort of this global thing of establishing a zero tolerance yeah. culture around harassment. So something like a, a strong written policy, but again, this needs to have teeth. Yeah. Otherwise stuff like what happened to me will happen and yes. clearer reporting procedures, loads of training for managers, for HR staff, but also something like a first responder training for everyone in the company. Yes. I think it would be so, so, so valuable. That is a very good practical thing that any organization can do because the last thing an organization wants is when it happens, then let's figure out how to deal with it. Like it's best to Absolutely. presume it either has already happened or high likelihood. Let's just prepare for that possibility. Well, yeah. like you said, two and five, you've got five people in that company. The probability is there. Yeah. So what can we do? It's going to happen because also we are human beings. Yeah. Sometimes stuff gets weird and sometimes interactions with people get weird. So even if it's not something that is malicious, yeah. we know that there's going to be a little bit of friction between people and potentially as a result of something of a sexual nature. So how can we put parameters in place to say, this is what our policy is. Every single new joiner has to read our policy, maybe has to take a quiz on what our policy is or what sexual harassment is. Yeah. What is consent? What are the appropriate parameters for working in this space? And here is the person that you can go to if you need to chat about it. Yeah. And this is what could be done. Yeah. So we've talked about HR and what leaders can do. Uh, if I am working in law enforcement, what are some things that I do that could be unhelpful to a victim and what would be much more helpful? So say I'm a police or an investigating officer. Yeah. Do you know what I think is is something that is so absolutely necessary in the Singapore context that I yeah. unfortunately had the um, the unlucky experience of having to sort of experience firsthand is victim support. There is none. There is support from outside organizations. So AWARE provides support, for example, you have the, the Sexual Assault Care Center. The support from the authorities that you get as a person who is trying to come forward as a victim of crime is non-existent. You get thrown around different IOs, different rooms, different spaces, no explanation of what's happening, no kind of guidance, no support, no psychological support. Um, people who have varying levels of being trauma informed when they're interviewing you and taking a witness statement. I think I had to give a witness statement four times um, to different people. And I was not given anything, any single bit of support or empathy at the time. And it was one of those really 
eye-opening moments because I think as a lawyer, I'm so used to being on the other side of that. I'm very, very used to being the person who's looking through the statements. Oh, these have already been taken from the lawyers. Where are we? What's this looking like? How, how, what are the parameters around this? Um, What's the case like? And you look at that from that logging in your mind. um, These are the key points of that, this crime. Are these proven, et cetera. When you're looking at this from the perspective of somebody who is a victim of a crime, um, it is completely different. You're not psychoanalyzing or critically analyzing your own case. I mean, I am as a lawyer, which I kind of think puts a very strange spin on things. But as a person who's not legally trained and who's not familiar with this system, you are in a vacuum. You are given so little support and guidance. And if I hadn't had people around me, and bear in mind, I've been involved in the Singaporean legal system since I was observing cases in court at the age of 12. Like I was always a super nerd when it came to the law. So I, I have known about the Singaporean criminal system for a very, very long time. And this was so alien to me as the victim, as being the person who was in the role of the sit, let's sit in a witness box. It was really, I think, discombobulating is probably the best word to say. And I think then if you're looking back on like what can be done, yeah, create comprehensive and trauma-informed victim support, I don't know, programs or people or have a section of like people who are reporting violent crimes, whether it yeah. is of a sexual nature or not, how can we help those people and maybe the authorities don't want to pay for our therapy. Okay. That's the, you know, fine. But maybe in this moment you want to have somebody to sit with you and say, this has happened to you. You are making a report to the police. Here is what our system is like. And here is a rough timeline. Someone will contact you once a month to tell you what is happening and how it's going on. Um, But for me, that didn't happen at all. And I didn't experience any empathy from the people who were taking my statements. So I was asked about why I was choosing to wear the outfit that I was choosing to wear in the moment while I was still wearing it, while I was still at the scene of the crime, while I was literally shaking and crying. Why were you wearing that? Where is the training? for people who are asking these questions. And do you know what? There is some, and it has been being given. So there needs to be more, or there needs to be more confirmation that that training is being put to good use in practice. It's empathy. It's all empathy. You need to understand that the people who are reporting these crimes aren't doing it because it's fun, because it's not fun. Yeah, so I'm definitely hoping together with you that the changes that we want to see in law enforcement are already happening. There are people within the system who are like trying to reshape the policies of that and the practices. Yeah. And we are so grateful for those of you who are listening, who might be in a system trying to do those things. Please do more. Right. I want to talk about like another stakeholder that we don't often consider. uh, And that's the media. Right. So what, would be helpful, sensitive ways of reporting or framing stories of sexual harassment and what are super unhelpful, super insensitive ways of reporting on it? I think maybe the key word for this entire chat that we're having is empathy. And I have experienced some amazing, amazing journalists who have understood that people who are sharing their stories are doing so with the aim to help others, that there is um, a big, big discussion to have be had around this. And you look at the big picture and you say, yes, this is one person's story. This one person's story is an example of this is what the bigger picture is. And this is the problem. And this is what we need to be fixing. Yeah. That's ultimately the approach that should be taken, right? And that's kind of what you want in any article or any discussion around it this is the bigger picture but the sensationalization of sexual violence and sexual crimes happens in Singapore 
at a rate that I have not seen anywhere else. Um, if you look even at like the tabloids in the UK, which are famously some of the worst, yeah. they don't do this. Um, it's the headlines that I have seen in Singapore around people who were reporting sexual violence. Yeah. It's probably what you could refer to as trauma porn. And the way that it is gathered, the number of people who have said to me, but can you give us more? What did he, what specifically did he say to you? What specifically happened? Can you just like, please, can we report this? Please, can we put this into writing? And I was like, you don't, you don't need to know this. Yeah. This isn't necessary. Like this is glorifying. I kind of see it in the same way as like, if you look at all of this obsession around i mean i'm i'm a true crime obsessive as much as the next person <laughs> yeah. but there's such a level of obsession around it and there's a kind of very strange attitude that people have to it it's like really really intense and really like oh oh this is what is this what did they say and it's it makes somebody who's trying to report their own story. It makes you, it makes me personally. It makes yeah. me very uncomfortable. I think a good example of this is um, I was interviewed on camera yeah. early on in the Me Too movement, and they were like, "Oh, we'll just we just need to shoot some." I don't really know what the I'm not an expert about this, but they were like, "We just want to shoot some like side profile things of just so that we can like have a glance towards your face." And I was like, "Okay, I'm, I mean, what's really the point? I'm not really saying anything." And he was yeah. like, "Stare off into the distance. Can you look a bit sadder? Yeah. Can you just um, can you cry?" I was like, "What?" And he was like, "Well, just think about the think about what the trauma made you feel. Just think about it right now. I want to see it on your face." I was like, "What?" <laughs> and this is Singaporean media. Yeah. Oh, good grief. Uh, yeah. Mm. So if there is uh, someone in a journalistic profession listening right now to this and they're like, okay, I want to make sure I handle, if, if it lands on my lap, I want to make sure I handle this well. What is a simple insight or pro tip you would like to tell this young, I want to do better journalist? <laughs> Understand that the people who are sharing their stories with you are not, they are real people and it's not like a novel and it's not a headline. It is their life. It is their traumatic experience. And how would you, if somebody you were really close to had the same exact experience, how would you like to hear about it really would you even like to hear about it to the level of detail that you may want to do yeah. you're not here to attract more readers so that you can shock people with all of the gory juicy details of what exactly happened it's you're reporting on something that is a traumatic event and how can you help the person sitting in front of you in that moment i have one last stakeholder that we often miss out in this like how can you do better conversation which is the bystander and you know we, we talked about like what, how families and friends ought to be more supportive or how you know helpful and helpful things and I think there are like bystanders who are removed from the situation you're not really connected with it maybe you are the colleague or the friend of a friend who heard rumors or even just a random stranger, like, oh, look, interesting online article. Like, what would be the, what would be, like, helpful and what would be, like, super, super unhelpful? <laughs> <laughs> well, strangers, let's take it from the macro, maybe, to the micro. Strangers on the internet, is it necessary? Is it nice? Is it kind? Are you putting your own judgment onto a situation that you have you know very little about yeah and if you're doing that and you're doing that on a public platform remember that you are in singapore and there are literal instagram pages dedicated to screenshotting people who make silly comments on the internet and laughing at them <laughs> <laughs> so internet trolls are to an extent always going to be internet trolls i think that building up 
an understanding of social media, even outside the context of what we're talking about, also then means that you're like anyone who puts anything on the internet yeah. is at this point aware of social media trolls. But if you are a troll yeah. and you want to maybe do better, <laughs> may- maybe don't type anything at all. <laughs> Good advice. But it- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but if you want to if you want to help, if somebody is posting something and saying they have are they having a difficult time and if you want to put something public on there, put a link to some resources. Say, I believe you. Write to them, DM them separately and say, I believe you. I'm so sorry that this has happened to you. Here are some resources. Or if you're in a space to do so, and many people aren't, and that's okay, yeah. I can, I'm can. i here to speak to you. And I, I think that that also then applies to the person who is a colleague, to yeah. the person who's heard of a friend of a friend. Yeah. Um, this happens to me quite a lot. I, I quite often get people saying, oh, a friend, a friend of one of my friends has experienced this. Can I put them in touch with you? I'm like, yeah. yeah. Oh my God, absolutely sure. Yeah. That's something that I'm very happy to do. And I'm always happy to do that. But will uh, what I will not do is, unless specifically asked, contact that person completely off the bat and be like, Oh hey, hey hey! So I've heard on the grapevine that this uh, really horrible thing has happened to you, oh, that's um, the worst. and people are talking about it. Yeah. So it's the worst, and even even like I'm I'm sure in the school playground, all yeah. of us have experienced something like this around like oh I've heard that something has happened to so and so, and then you yeah. know someone asks you about it, and you're like oh great, let me just relive yet another time this horrible thing that that I'm yeah. going through at this moment. That is not what we're after if you want to be a supportive and helpful friend in this context then how can you sort of navigate your way through without pushing boundaries that that are there yeah but also just like setting yourself up as a person that people want to come and talk to about this so it's almost like a lifestyle thing as well and like moving through society or moving through your friendships in a way that is kind yes. and loving and yes and I am the first person to say I'm literally the most sarcastic person you've ever met in your entire life but I also make it a habit of saying this is I I joke around a lot but I do very deeply believe that I want to be there for you as a friend yeah. I love you very much as a friend and that's a lot of different language and I'm always as as yeah. you, I'm sure you've understood very highly therapized yeah. so that's something that I'm very comfortable saying but it wasn't something that I was comfortable saying a few years ago yeah. so creating that safe space and maybe not approaching people who are going through a tough time unless they ask you for it yeah. but then when they do ask you for it giving that space to say I believe you thank you for telling me what can I do for you if you need anything here are some resources not pushing them to go to the authorities or to report or anything unless they say to you yeah I think this is what I want to do can you help me do that and then absolutely agreed would you like me to come to the police station with you would you like me to not come to the police station with you would you like me to come to sit with HR with you would you like me to help with an email or something like that and Always, I think number one thing, if somebody does come to you in the context of workplace harassment and says, I think I'm being harassed, um, what can I do? Tell them to save everything. Tell them to save every document, every email, every text message, screenshot it, send it to their own personal email. Do not get rid of anything. Number one thing. Yeah. Mm, No, I love that. It's very practical. It's good. So random bystanders, if you are listening to this podcast, the very, very least you can do, please do not go up to a survivor victim and say, Ooh, I heard something happen to you. Tell me the details. Like that's the worst, worst. People's trauma are not grist for your rumor mill. Yeah. People's trauma is not juicy gossip. Mm-hmm.